After someone raised a very valid point on VI control, I have memoed the entire company about whether they individually want to opt out of appearing in the vlog. Uh, I think in general people are happy, but you're absolutely right. When I was editing, I could see people kind of getting out of shot and stuff, and I think it's only fair that if people want to get on with their work, or indeed drinking beer and playing Mario Kart, they can do it without a camera being shoved in their face. So there's a new etiquette. I ask their permission before I start filming and I'm aware of people who don't want to appear, which is absolutely cool. I've been uh, filming lots this week, but have failed to form a cohesive narrative, uh, mainly because it's been a real heads down, heavy Spitfire week, lots of meetings. Instead of boring you with yet more admiration of Oliver's desk, here's a quick 30 second montage. <laughs> I gave up having a universal template now, so that's a kind of big rig, all of the sounds that I own, all of the kind of the go-to sounds, the workhorse sounds, the obscure sounds, so I could go quickly between projects. Um, I stopped using those um, because I found that with that kind of track count, I think it was something ridiculous, like 700, um, that I would uh, basically just rely on the old faithfuls. And when I went to the old faithfuls, I'd make the same shapes. And when I made the same shapes, I made the same music. So there was a lot of kind of uh, homogeny between projects, which I didn't like. So what I do now is I just make a template for each uh, project. I think this keeps it a lot fresher. It makes me investigate new libraries, new sounds, which again, offers me more inspiration, uh, more original ideas uh, within my own own output. Um, but what I found myself doing is, although I make a completely new template for every project, there is actually a process that I repeat often. So what I'm going to do, because I'm just about to start two projects, is create a template for my templates, basically so I don't have to do this twice for these two new projects. The other thing I've noticed is uh, when I get to the uh, end of uh, any job these days, uh, I lose my sight by about half an inch. And uh, after the last inside number nine, it's now about this far away where I can actually focus. So I'm actually going to start having to wear these um, so I can actually see what I'm doing. OK, so. So first, I'm just going to have a look at uh, the look of things. I can't stand icons. I hate skewmorph. I use freeze. I use a lot of drones, and I don't like that latch MIDI thing. Um, so I, you know, if it, particularly if you're using things like Evos and stuff, I want to go in, and I don't want it to trigger uh, the uh, the Evo at the beginning. I want it to actually be midway through. So often I will freeze stuff if it's really long. I'm going to look at my metronome settings. And it's very important that uh, you don't have any accents, so that's all cool. It's a kind of nominal volume that I will set. I like to have the old uh, list here, tempo list. All of my cues start from bar five, uh, which basically mean I always uh, start the orchestra from bar three. Uh, the reason I do that is uh, the orchestra needs two clear bars, one bar for the conductor, one bar for the band. I've also found over the years that certain plugins and certain bits of MIDI do weird things in bar one. So two clear bars gives the door time to catch up. Okay, the other thing that we do is because it's uh, telly that I'm gonna be doing these two projects, uh, I don't know why this is the protocol, but Tele starts from hour 10, uh, the Simpty. And talking of Simpty and synchronization, let's make sure that we're spitting out some MTC, MIDI timecode to, I've got an IAC driver, Logic to Pro Tools. So theoretically, when I hit play in Logic, go to Pro Tools, yeah, Pro Tools is playing. We love that. Synchronicity, brilliant. Okay, someone's gonna scream at me for doing this, but I think there's a thing called stacks or something, but uh, I've not learned how to do that. So basically what I do is I create a, a zero output just to title the various, to title the various categories uh, that I have. So strings. Now, I'm not suggesting that um, 
I'm going to be using all of these on these uh, projects. Um, but these are basically all of the categories I can imagine. So then we've got pianos. OK, let's stick a contact in there. There we go. Sometimes with TV, I do actually mix it myself, which means I tend to do it internally in Logic. Um, but I know for these two projects, we'll be mixing externally with a mix engineer, so it will be track laid into Pro Tools. With this in mind, uh, we have to keep everything uh, unique. So every track has a unique identifier. Um, so I'm going to start the tracks uh, from 100. So we're going to have a fictitious strings long and a strings short. So I will eventually load uh, presets into these strings, pits, call. So that needs to be 300. Strings, harmonics, tremolo, effects. So basically what I do is I always output these on different playback stems. The reason for this is um, it's a sampling quirk, but basically when you ask players to stop playing, um, they never stop dead, so they always diminuendo off. So the release triggers for longs are always much, much lower uh, audibly than shorts. Uh, so uh, I separate those off so that they can be assigned different reverbs. But also, certain things like ostinatos um, and stuff, you may actually want to uh, use different amounts in with the live. Stuff like pits and colenio, often, if it's incredibly complicated stuff, I will simply use the samples. Also, string players aren't a great fan of colenio, so if you're really caning it, I'll just use the samples. And finally, uh, the effects, harmonics and tremolos, I often use these as just textural little bits of sprinkle pixie dust on the top, and I find it to be not a particularly good use of resources if you're divisying small sections up to play these stuff that sounds perfectly all right with samples. Uh, so what's going to happen there is we're going to create a bus, bus one, four, and you'll start seeing there's a kind of nice synchronicity between these numbers, the bus numbers, and then you'll see the actual uh, playback tracks will have a, a similar uh, protocol to them. Okay, so let's go. So, just going to name these. Okay, so let's change up our colour. This just helps you navigate through. Okay, and we need to then create some boring old audio tracks. We need 16 of them, so one. And here we go. So, 001, strings long. So just making sure that those uh, tracks have the correct input there from the buses that we created earlier. It's unfortunate that the input doesn't have the title on. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So basically, I want to put them into groups. Uh, the reason we use uh, auxiliaries and tracks is obviously I want to record the playback stems into the tracks, but tracks are quite clumsy things to uh, monitor through. Uh, you have to put them into record, into input monitor. Um, so it's uh, because we'll basically be toggling between the tracks and the auxiliaries, I need to uh, sort out a uh, grouping. So let's put these, group one, and then the playback. So those those all mute off nicely like that. That's what we want them to do. And then these, group two. And I'll leave them muted uh, because we want the auxiliary inputs to be the default. Okay, now we're going to assign some uh, reverbs. So we'll make... Uh, Bus 17, our reverb bus. And this is just totally through uh, practice. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of aware of uh, how much reverb uh, you need to give these different elements. But I will tweak it as and when I start assigning sounds. So lots of reverb for the longs, a little bit less for the shorts, very little for the pizzicato. Uh, lots for the harmonic tremolos and effects. And then we mirror that somewhat with the brass, woods, 
brilliant. Uh, I haven't decided uh, which reverb I'm going to use yet because uh, the first project I'm going to be doing is a collaboration with the guys in uh, King's Cross. And also I'm having my studio wired up. So I may not use the TC6000 uh, uh, because uh, it's obviously it's a bit of outboard that I can't drag around with me. So I might even use the uh, Logic Space Designer just to do uh, my mock-ups with, uh, um, just so that I'm totally portable uh, whilst the studio is being wired, but also whilst I'm going up and down to uh, London from Edinburgh. So I made a bit of a boo-boo here. That is actually uh, an audio channel, and I want that to be an instrument channel. So I, what I did is I, I duplicated the underdub audio uh, for the percussion. So let me just uh, reassign those as contact. Great. Awesome. So let's just lay in a little bit of MIDI. Whilst I usually use an orchestrator to do stuff, who will do it in Sibelius. Um, just change that to red. Um, uh, I often will have to do the underdubs uh, myself. Uh, and I think on one of these projects, I will be orchestrating my contribution. So basically, the next and final step is to go into uh, Logic's score editor and uh, remove some of its annoying quirks. Again, this is just to save time, particularly when I'm doing underdubs. I tend to leave those till the last minute of doing the charts. And uh, setting up these things for every single cue that I'm going to record is an absolute PITA. So... Um, here we go. Uh, so let's hit it into score mode. So numbers and names first. Let's get rid of the uh, instrument names. Bye bye. And um, I haven't figured this out yet. Let's see if we can do this on Logic, whereby it's really important to get a bar number above every single bar. So if it, is it zero? No, that puts it at the front. That's not right. Um, it just really speeds things up because you can just stare at the bar and go, let's pick it up from bar, whatever, without having to count along. So if we try one, yeah, that's it. Brilliant. Awesome. Uh, and also these these always really too low above the um, the stanza. So I'm going to make those an arbitrary 80. And then with the global, I'm a massive uh, sustain pedal slag. So if you hit zero, that'll mean there'll be no uh, sustain pedal uh, symbols, uh, which are usually littered when I work uh, with it. And then I'm going to make a maximum number of bars, eight. Nice symmetry there. Um, and then uh, we're just going to reduce the size um, and let's just drag that down to five, which is just a slightly more manageable size. So finally, the trusty sync plop, which I've got loads. Let's create its own dedicated channel and take it off that group as well. We don't need it in that group. And drag that on to bar one. Okay, so I've got these uh, these kind of dead contacts in there. What I'll start doing is loading sounds in and, uh, you know, so strings long, say consort will be 101, strings flautando be 102, uh, and all of that kind of stuff. But then I will reorder it. So violins, violas, they will kind of go in order. The numbers will go out of order, but the tracks will be in an order that's kind of intuitive to me. Um, but the thing is, they're all stemming to the correct outputs. So uh, I don't need to worry about kind of making an intuitive uh, mute path or anything like that. Um, uh, everything's all set up and ready to go. So that's taken roughly 45 minutes to do. Now, imagine if we did that retrospectively, uh, set up those playback stems and the colours and all the scoring stuff and uh, this, that and the other, you know, uh, clicks for bar five, sync plop, all of that. Um, if we did that uh, retrospectively, say after I'd done maybe 50 cues, I calculate that's about 2,125 minutes that would take, which is 37 and a half hours. Uh, so you divide that into 10 hour days and you're talking about 3.75 days. So that's the best part of a week that we've saved there by taking 45 minutes in advance to prepare a template template.